Good evening, all the listeners, all the e-listeners. Uh, let's go ahead. Uh, test radiograph is one of the frequently ordered um, radiographic examinations in children as well as, as well as adults. Hence, the accurate interpretation is very important for administrating appropriate therapy. So, uh, for that, we have to. Uh, there is a systematic way of uh, interpreting the uh, chest X-ray. It goes like this. This is a suggested scheme. Uh, first and the topmost is the patient demographics. First, you have to uh, ensure that you are reading the right person's radiograph. Uh, you have to check the side markers, uh, the right left side markers, and the date. Uh, make sure you are reading the um, current examination. And then, uh, if you have, if the the priors are available, always compare. It's really of uh, great use uh, uh, comparing comparing with the old uh, radiograph. It will solve a lot of problems. So, so that's about the patient demographics. Let's move on to the uh, technical factors. Usually, the commonly done, uh, commonly done the examination is the PA view. Usually, PA view, and it is obtained by with the patient in uh, standing position, uh, facing the cassette or the image image capture device. In case of these DR systems, um, where the image is directly acquired onto the uh, those capture devices. Um, I mean, conventionally, we have this X-ray films loaded into the cassettes, placed in the uh, holders, and then uh, exposures, X-ray exposure. Then it needs to be I mean, developed in the dark room. Now, nowadays, it's, uh, it's not that commonly used. Um, most of them are either uh, CR computer uh, CR, they are called CR radiography, or in a in a tertiary care centers, usually they are DR systems. Um, so it's it's done with the uh, the distance between the tube and the X-ray is around six feet. That's the standard um, um, uh, that's the standard PA view. How it is done, and the sorry. Okay. Next, the the other factors are the centering. Uh, 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 the patient need to be centered to the uh, to the to the cassette or the uh, image capture device, and then uh, there are ways to uh, determine how I mean how well it is centered, and then the markers. You have to place the markers on the uh, cassettes or the uh, this capture devices, right? And here are the uh, some of the examples of the image on the left is with was done with a um, low exposure factor. That means using low KV, say around less than 60 KV. You see, it's all uh, it shows the lung details are well uh, seen in the on this. But however, the other details it's not very appealing. Um, you may miss some. You know, if there's anything in the retrocardic region, you may miss it. Okay. Then the next, the image on the right, where it is done at a high exposure, say something like 120 kV or so, where the lungs are burnt out. They they look really black, and you cannot really see much in the uh, lungs. But whereas you can see the other structures like osseous structures and all. So it has to be between these two, and depending on the indi uh, indication. So. A perfect radiograph should look like this. Uh, see how beautiful it looks with all the everything being displayed. You can see the lung markings very well. You can see the all the uh, rib cage, diaphragms, everything fantastically um, depicted. Okay, and then here the centering is about uh, the patient. If the patient is well centered, you can see this. I will use this. Um, Highlighter. You can see this. These are the transverse processes, and that's your uh, middle end of the clavicle. That it should be equidistant. Otherwise, if the patient is rotated, say uh, right or left rotation, the cardiac size um, may look larger. I mean, uh, spuriously large. Hence, the centering is very important. You have to make sure that the patient is uh, centered. Um, in accurate position. 
Next comes the same thing, it's in the diagrammatic representation. Those are the, uh, the transverse process, uh, sorry, the spinous process and this medial end, is, they should be equidistant. This distance should be the same. Then you get the, uh, that's the uh, accurate centering. Next, look for the trachea. So I'll uh, start from, uh, in a systematic way, uh, start with uh, trachea. After all this demographics and the technical factors, make note of all that and then move on to uh, the actual interpretation uh, track here. First, look for the, see how it looks, look for the narrowing, that's the lucency. You can see this lucency here, that is the tracheal shadow. Look for any narrowing, displacement, uh, you can see this is a carina here. Any widening of the carina, uh, make, make observation of that. Normally, if the radiograph is done in, uh, uh, usually it is done in good inspiration. Um, if it is done, say, patient cannot hold breath or not not able to follow the instructions, uh, in, in expert review, there may be some uh, bulging or kink of the trachea to the right. That is normal. Whereas um, in a good inspired review, if you see there is a uh, there is a deviation to one side. Uh, further interrogation is required for that. And then the next next move on to the heart and media steno. Once the trachea is over. Then move on to the uh, media stenum, heart and media stenum. The commonly, uh, the structures that form the borders of the media stenum on the right, in the superior portion of the right, there comes the innominate artery, and then that follows the uh, superior vena cava, and then in in some parts, a portion of the ascending aorta will also form the right heart border. Further down, the this is the right heart border. Uh, form, these are, these all form the um, uh, right media sternum, right media sternal borders. On the left, on the this is the aortic arch, aortic knuckle it is called. Um, cranial to this is usually the subclavian artery or innominate veins form that part, and that is the aortic arch. Then followed by this is your pulmonary bay. Okay, that's and then the this the left heart border is formed predominantly by the um, predominantly by the left ventricle. And then you can see in the background, if it's an elderly patient, you can see this, the iota, descending thoracic iota can also be seen uh, if it has unfolded. Even here, there's a little bit of unfolding here. That's why we are able to see this right, uh, the ascending iota very well, right? The, now the cardiac anatomy, cardiac, what constitutes uh, these borders? You can see the right heart border, the SVC, and then predominantly the right Lower right heart border is predominantly found by the right atrium. The right ventricle is not depicted on the AP radiograph. So it's anterior, hence we do not see it. Um, unless it is enlarged, we cannot um, make that out. The left heart border is found by the left ventricle. And the apex, uh, apex is, uh, uh, heart apex is found by the left ventricular apex. And you can see the pulmonary artery, that's where the pulmonary bay was there corresponding uh, cardiac anatomy. Next, let's, let's move on to this uh, measurement of this cardiothoracic ratio. This is very important uh, uh, for the radiologists. Uh, hence, the how it is measured, I mean, you must be aware most of them. Um, it, it is the, it goes like this, the draw a line, the midline uh, on this, trans, on this uh, spinous process. Take the maximum diameter onto the right and to the left, add these two, or you can actually take this diameter, measure it, and then you have the other measurement you have to take is the maximum inner diameter, right? And then that ratio is C1, C2 by 2T, that is the inner uh, transverse thoracic diameter will give you the uh, cardiothoracic ratio into 100. It usually it should not ex exceed uh, 50 to 55 percent in uh, Caucasians. Uh, it, it is up it is up to 50, uh, it is normal up to 55% in other races. In units, uh, you got to be very careful here. Um, up to 60%, don't overcall them unless it is, um, you know, uh, real cardiomegaly. Uh, do not call cardiomegaly on the units because up to 60% is normal for them. So in the maximum transfer diameter of the heart in men is around 16 centimeters and 15 in, in women helps in, this helps in comparison. So whenever there is, uh, when you are comparing radiographs, 
the interval difference of 2 centimeters increase in diameter is, is significant when originally it was normal. Uh, whereas in enlarged hearts, uh, much less change is significant. So you have to keep this in mind. The maximum diameter of the, the 16 and 15, these are also very important. I mean, say this is that maximum transverse diameter. So this will help. And, uh, and one more point is uh, from the midline, if you see if the this diameter should be less than 5.5. I mean, anything above 5.5, okay, and it, anything about above 5.5 um, uh, is that right atrial enlargement. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next one, the hyla. Once the mediastinum, uh, you have to look for the widening of the mediastinum also. Uh, um, this is the one. Usually, uh, we take it as uh, 5 centimeters. If it is more than 5, um, this is on a PA radiograph, mind you. The, the, all these measurements change on uh, AP view, right? The AP views are usually not done routinely, only in, you know, when patient cannot stand, debilitated, or in the ICUs, these AP views are done. So always look for this, uh, uh, this media channel widening. You have to allow for, on AP radiographs, this, there will be, in fact, this will be exaggerated because of the, you know, uh, positioning of the uh, cassette. There will be some magnification of the heart and the media channel. Hence, you have to allow a uh, little more than 5 mm, 5 centimeters, sorry. So let's move on to the hyla, the next part. The the hyla, left hilum is always higher than the right, and they should be of same density, and they should have clear uh, uh, defined lateral borders. And what constitutes the, these are the, this, these are the, this is the inferior pulmonary artery, in fact, and that is your uh, upper low pulmonary veins. These two form the, hilum in fact. So uh, pulmonary arteries and upper low veins contribute to the hyla shadows. So left pulmonary artery lies above the main left main bronchus. Okay, it goes above the main bronchus, hence it's always higher uh, until unless there is a pathology um, in the lower lobe that pulls it down. Um, and the left pulmonary artery lies anterior to the left main bronchus. Um, okay, again the right pulmonary artery, hence it is lower. The diameter of the normal pulmonary artery is 10 to 16 mm in males and 9 to 15 in females. See, it has to be measured in the mid pulmonary artery level. It should not exceed that diameter. Uh, those are useful in uh, calling it as for determining the pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, and then the, uh, and the, uh, and the arrangement of the veins and arteries. In the upper lobes, the veins lie lateral to the arteries. Whereas in the lower lobes, they lie medial to the arteries. Here you can see this is the, I'm going to remove all this. Uh, okay, uh, that is the pulmonary artery. And whereas you can see in the lower lobe, they are medial. They are medial. You can see this, this there's a branch here that goes in. Okay, that is, those are the pulmonary veins. Uh, they, they are medial in the lower lobes, whereas they are uh, lateral on the upper lobes the location of the pulmonary veins. And one more important thing is at the first intercostal space, the upper low vessel, so let, let it be artery or vein, this is the first intercostal space. It should not exceed 3 mm. It should not, the diameter of the vessel should not exceed 3 mm. So whenever there is increased, uh, either a, uh, that is cephalization, pulmonary venous hypertension or cephalization uh, can be called. Right, and then, uh, whereas the arteries accompany the bronchi in the interstitium, you can see the, um, in the though you cannot pick up, uh, see the interstitium on, uh, on the radiograph, the arteries and bronchi go together, whereas the veins, they drain through the interlobular septa. So that's about the hyla. And the bronchial vessels, usually they're not seen on the radiographs because um, uh, they, uh, they're not seen because of their location. They usually arise from the ventral descending thoracic aorta at T5 or T6, T5, T6 level. Usually two on the left and one on the right. And this is highly variable. Um, this is highly variable. And then these enlarged bronchial arteries in case of this congenital heart disease, 
may appear as small nodules around the hyena. So that we have to, uh, uh, you have to, hence you know the patient is, has got a uh, little heart disease. Look for these collaterals uh, around the hilar, around the hilar shadows. Okay, right. The next move on to the uh, diaphragms. So usually the right diaphragm, uh, this is how it looks, the right diaphragm is higher, the right diaphragm is higher than the left. This is uh, uh, what is commonly seen. And then in small percentage of population, the left is higher. And any, the, if the difference between the two domes of the diaphragm is more than uh, three centimeters, then it is significant. Always when you're uh, on a, on a peer radiograph, look for the free air under the domes of diaphragm. If you look in these regions, that's the gastric bubble. Okay, right? And then that's, uh, that is about the diaphragms. And next move on to the fissures. The lung fissures, uh, we have one uh, oblique, oblique and mi one major and one minor fissure on the right, and whereas on the left uh, we got only one oblique fissure. So these fissures are usually not seen on the um, uh, frontal radiograph, or PA radiograph, uh, uh, because of the angle uh, through. I mean, the angle they are located. They are not for the for any fissure to be visualized on the frontal radiograph. They should be perpendicular to the beam of the. Uh, to the X-ray beam, then only sometimes we do see this minor fissure on the right side. Uh, more so when there is pathology in the upper lobes, and then arching of the fissures uh, can be picked up. Or sometimes uh, when the pleural effusion, when there is pleural effusion, it gets back to the minor fissure and they appear uh, lenticular, lenticular shape. On the lateral radiograph, you can see this major fissure starts say uh, five centimeters anterior to the. Um, anterior border of the sternum and then it uh, uh, it takes oblique course whereas the, my, the minor fissure you can see it's only on the right side it's only on the right and that the one the the lung between this uh, minor and major fissures is this is the middle lobe whereas on the left side you can see only one fissure so not, not much confusion so then let's move on to the costophenic angles. You can see this on the anterior view. You can see this very sharp. Uh, that means there's no effusion. And then on the, if you have lateral views, uh, this posterior cardiophrenic sulcus, if the, even if there's a very minimal fluid, um, it can be seen in this posterior car, uh, uh, costophrenic sulcus. So always look for the, as the patient, I mean, as it, uh, in the elderly patient, say, suppose this, CP angles are a little blunted because you know fat accumulation and then some flattening of the domes due to this um, you know hyperexpansion of the lungs. So always look for these um, uh, cardiophrenic angles, especially the lateral to pick up minimal minimal effusion. And then if you observe the the right diaphragm is almost completely visualized, whereas a small portion of the left is not seen. Uh, that is because of the heart is sitting on this. And then, says, uh, and then the left diaphragm is always, when in majority of cases, it is lower because of the uh, heart is sitting on that. Uh, contrary to the notion that uh, that the sub, the hepatic, the liver that is located in the right upper quadrant pushes the right uh, hemidiaphragm. That's not true. It's mainly because of the um, heart sitting and then depressing the diaphragm, the central portion of the diaphragm, the left portion. Then move on to the lung fields. So always, I mean, you can follow a standard pattern. First, look at the lungs and move outside, or start from the out, uh, start from the center. Trachea, mediastinum, heart, hyla. Then look at the diaphragms. Look at the CP angles. Then go to the lungs. And then this is the recommended pattern. You have to sweep through through the lungs in a systematic fashion so that you not you should not leave out any portion of the lung. And then you should always compare for the compare with the opposite side for any um, change in pattern. Um, so that comparison really helps. I mean, comparing it to the opposite side, opposite lung. So always follow a pattern. Uh, examine each and every part of the lung so that you do not miss out uh, small nodules or any any abnormality. So it will be good practice, you know, to carefully observe for the. Uh, lung fields in a systematic way, 
do it from the top and then start again from the lower part and then go up again. Uh, do it a couple of times so that you don't miss out any um, any of the lung field. And always look for the translucency in the lungs, uh, whether it is symmetric or asymmetrical. And uneven distribution of the lung markings, you have to make note of that. Any abnormal shadow uh, to be further interrogated. Uh, sometimes these normal structures, when they overlap, especially at the lung apices, the ribs and the um, uh, they make the uh, normal structures look abnormal. So you have to carefully look for that. Make sure uh, you're not you're not missing out anything there. So the next, the lung segments to pick up the pathology in the lungs. You can see here the lung segments, upper, middle, and lower lobes. On the right, you have um, uh, ten segments. On the left, you have eight segments. Uh, only difference is that on the left. The apical and uh, posterior segments, uh, it's a single segment and then in the, uh, and in the lower lobe, left lower lobe, the instead of anterior and medial basal individual segments, you have anterior medial basal uh, single segment. So each segment will have its own uh, um, bronchus, the pulmonary artery branch, um, and then on, whereas in the middle lobe, you have this medial and lateral segments and in the lingula, the superior and inferior. So to make note of this, otherwise uh, they're pretty much the same on both sides. And then the this is the diagrammatic representation um, of the segments well, on the AP view. Say on the if you're looking from the if you're looking on the AP view, most of the anterior part in the upper lobe. Well, this is the um, pink or violet. This is the anterior anterior segment of the right upper lobe. This blue one is the anterior segment of the left upper lobe. And that is the apico-posterior segment on the left, and that is the epi uh, apical segment on the right. The large, small orange thing is the uh, that is the posterior segment. This is as seen on the anterior view, on the AP radiograph rather. And that is on the posterior radiograph. You will see most of it uh, is formed by the lower lobes. In fact, see very little part is formed by the um, upper lobe segment. You can see that's a little bit of. Uh, um, uh, anterior segment and that's the posterior segment. Uh, this is all. This, this is a, oh sorry. This is on the left uh, because of the reverse. This is the left lung, so left and uh, that is the right because right. You can see that's the uh, posterior segment and that is the apical segment. Anterior segment is not seen here. On the left, you can see the most of it is formed by the lower lobe, right? And there are, you have different segments. The diagrammatic representation, and then this is the right lateral and left lateral uh, projections, um, and that is the this is the medial medial lobe area, and that is your lingular area, and this is the this is all lower lobe, and that's the upper lobe. Right here, you can see that is the apical. This is the right side, right apical segment. That's the posterior segment. That's the anterior segment. Okay, let's move on. And then uh, just a brief anatomy on the microscopic anatomy on this um, bronchus divisions. Actually, the bronchus, the main bronchus divides into 6 to 20 times before it becomes bronchioles. Uh, that means the terminal bronchiole. That is the, this is the terminal bronchiole. And this terminal bronchiole divides, receives two or three respiratory, respiratory bronchioles. And each respiratory bronchiole receives up to uh, 2 to 11 alveolar ducts and each duct has 2 to 6 alveolar sacs and each sac is made up of um, several I mean thousands of alveoli. So uh, this whole unit from this terminal bronchiole till this, this is called acinus. Acinus. This forms the when you, when someone, dis when someone describes airspace opacity, they're talking about this, you know, acinar opacities. Alveolar opacity. This is or the whole thing is the single acinus. This many the terminal bronchioles, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, sacs, and then the alveoli form one single acinus. And there is a cross communication between these alveolar sacs. Uh, that's why you see this in a in a consolidated or atlactic lung. You can see this air uh, air in totally collapsed uh, parts of the lung. That's because of the drift from the um, one alveoli, I mean, alve between the alveoli, air drift between the alveoli. So that's a brief anatomy about the acinus. Now move on to this, once this is done, go, go on to the hidden areas. 
So this is the lung apices where uh, the lesions are commonly missed. And then uh, the lateral aspects of the lungs. And then the costophrenic ang angles, costophrenic sulci. And uh, on the lateral view, look for the lucency in the, uh, I'll talk about this a little later. Look for the lucency, retrocardic and uh, uh, retrosternal lucencies. And look for the diagrams, look for free air. Uh, and uh, and also look for the osseous structures, especially in pediatric population. Uh, look for this rib fractures and all. And move on to this uh, soft tissues. Once um, once the uh, uh, because once the rest of the areas are over, move on to soft tissue where you have to look for the breast shadows. When there is uh, mastectomy, this can give rise to the increase in uh, translucency in one lung. So hence, uh, it is important to look for the uh, breast shadows in case of females, but to look for any asymmetry or any um, mastectomy, document that. And sometimes these nipple shadows, they're usually symmetric shadows in the lower lung zones. Don't, don't, don't confuse them for um, um, nodules. If there is doubt, so place a nipple markers and then repeat. And then these skin, skin folds, especially when the um, radiographs are done in oblique position, say when the patient is not centered very well, you have these axillary folds and the other skin folds that overlie the um, that overlie the lung lung fields, hence you have to make note of them. And then companion shadows, uh, you have, uh, for, especially for the clavicles, you have uh, uh, companion shadows, I'll show that here and see that. Yeah, you can see that that is the companion shadow there. So that those make note of all that. And then uh, to conclude, before concluding, you have to look for the subdiaphragmatic regions, right? And then that is look for free air. This is one of the uh, most important indications. The patients land up with, you know, acute chest pain. And if you see, they'll have a free air. So, so it's very important to, to look for the all the regions of the chest X-ray. So that you're not not missing out on anything. Look for the dilated bowel loops in the in the upper upper uh, abdominal regions, and then uh, sometimes you do see this uh, interposition of bowel loops in the uh, right upper quadrant. That is chiliatity syndrome. That is a normal finding. So um, always make note of these things, and then move on to this osseous structures. Interrogate each and every um, structure. You look for the sternum for any you know, any abnormality, look for the vertebrae. If you're able to see all the vertebrae, look for the height of each vertebrae, and then follow each and every rib and look for any fractures, any osteolytic lesions, any sclerotic lesions on the lateral view, uh, any compression of the decrease in height. You have to note for the decrease in height of these vertebrae, and then look for the sternum. So, I mean, uh, lateral view is best for the sternum. Right. So, and then moving on to the uh, lateral radiograph, how to interpret this lateral radiograph. So, uh, this, uh, let's see, observe this, this is the cardiac shadow here, right, and you can look for the diaphragm, domal diaphragms. This, what is seen at, under these uh, cardiac, um, uh, cardiac margins, this is the right dome because the left dome, you can see from here on, the le anterior part of the uh, left dome is not visualized because the heart is sitting on that, hence, that is obscured, the diaphragmatic margin is obscured. So look for this retrosternal space. This should usually should not be more than um, three centimeters. In say in COPD patients, this will increase. The retrosternal lucency would increase. And then look for the retrocardiac space, look for this space. If there's any um, any opacity, that means you're, uh, and that is not seen, if that is not seen on the corresponding PA view, that means you're, you are looking at some mediastinal mass. Even this space is filled up in case of anterior mediastinal masses, like say thymomas or any lymphoma. This space gets filled up, and um, and also look for the see this translucency as the caudally as you move caudally, um, this translucency should increase. Uh, this is very important because sometimes the any pathology in the lower lobes say early pneumonitis kind of stuff. Uh, this is the only finding you would see on the lateral radiograph. So it's very important. And then follow this uh, tracheal margins. Okay, and this round structure is the 
um, right upper lobe bronchus. This is the left upper lobe bronchus. And um, and look for the cardiac size. I mean, um, if there is any cardiomegaly, more and more of the heart occupies this retrosternal space. Uh, the same way if there is any enlargement of the left atrium and left ventricles, you'll see this encroachment of this retrocardiac space. And uh, uh, look for the diaphragmatic outlines, as I told. And then fissures, you have to observe for the fissures. Uh, now, that is your retrosternal, that is retrocardiac spaces. And then that corresponding cardiac anatomy. You can see most of this, oh, just let me go back. Uh, yeah, this, you can see here there is a, a small fold. That's the IVC marking. And uh, you can pick it up on if it is uh, well done radiograph. And you will see this. IVC, IVC entering into the right atrium in fact. So that is the IVC corresponding anatomy. The, you can see this right ventricle is anterior hence you do not see it unless it is enlarged. Um, the same with the uh, left ventricle obviously it will show because the left heart border is formed by the left ventricle and then the left atrium is again concealed. You will not see this on the PA radiograph or AP radiograph because it is posterior located posteriorly hence you would not see it on uh, uh, um, see it on AP unless it is enlarged. Um, so some of the sci uh, signs of this enlarged uh, right left atrium is you may see this double atrial shadow, uh, right heart border, um, one more border onto the right. I'll show that a later. And then uh, there may be carinal widening. You can observe this carinal widening. Uh, I'll show that later as well. And that is the aortic um, arch, aortic arch. Right. And then let's move on to some of the important signs um, in the on the chest radiograph. If you look at the silhouette sign, uh, there's one of the important sign called silhouette sign. That means uh, um, this helps in localizing the lesions. Um, okay, by using this mediastinal diaphragmatic borders. These borders are uh, you can see here. Oh, this is an example in normal lung. Um, I'll go back. In normal lung, you are able to see this border very well because uh, this lung is very well ventilated, hence you are able to see this border. So that we have to use the, that principle. And in case of pathology, say some pathology is sitting in the um, any of the lung, uh, say right middle lobe, these borders are obliterated and then this lesion is localized. We can see in this case, you can see this right heart border is, is not very, very well seen except for the lower portion. That means there is a pathology in the, I can localize this pathology to the right middle lobe. So this, the right middle lobe is in very close contact with the, um, the right heart border. So when there is a pathology, this gets up, obscured. That, I mean, this will tell us um, that there is pathology in the lung. And then conversely, the border is retained. So suppose you see, and I'll show this example. If the border is retained, the abnormality is superimposed. That means, it may be, this may be either located anterior or posterior, not in same plane as that of the right heart border. If the lesion is located not in the same plane as that of the right heart border, the right heart border will not be uh, silhouetted. So, so obliteration may occur with either any of the pathologies, mediastinal, pleural, or pulmonary pathologies. And then this is the classic example of uh, uh, pneumonia and the or consolidation in the right middle lobe that is obscuring the. And another is the lingular border uh, is in close contact with the left heart border. So if you see any lingular pathology, so the left heart border will be obscured. And the epicoposterior segment lies close to the aortic arch. So if there's any pathology in this epicoposterior segment of the left upper lobe, uh, if you see this aortic knob will be obliterated. And then the anterior segments of the right upper lobe and right middle lobe lie against the right aortic border as well. So sometimes we, this also in this case, like in this case, you can see the right right aortic border is also obscured. So another important sign is this hilum overlay sign. So in this case, uh, this is to differentiate between the hilar and hilar slash mediastinal masses from the heart mass, heart mass or heart pathology. Like say suppose there's pleural effusion, uh, sorry pericardial effusion. So if it is a mediastinal mass, it overlies the hilum. I'll show the example. Whereas the cardiac pathology, like uh, say large pericardial effusion, it will displace the um, hilar structures laterally. So in this case, look at this example. So that um, right, 
You can see this. There is a mass in the left hilum, right? And uh, you can see, you can see the hilar structures through it. That means this mass is located either anterior or posterior to the hilum. So this is called a hilum overlay sign. Whereas if there is a, a large pericardial effusion, this will actually push the hilum laterally like that. So that is hilum overlay sign. So another uh, important sign is this air bronchogram. You would have often heard this air bronchogram. This is this is exclusively seen with uh, intrapulmonary uh, pathology, and then this is commonly seen with either uh, pneumonic consolidation or uh, pulmonary edema, and uh, and in uh, and this would be seen only if the bronchus is patent. If the proximal bronchus is patent, you would see this air bronchogram because uh, uh, because the air column is patent. Hence, you would see it. Otherwise, if it is occluded totally, you may not see this. You may not see the air bronchogram at all. So, other causes would be atelectasis, severe uh, interstitial pneumonia, inter interstitial disease, and neoplasm, uh, especially uh, post-obstructive uh, consolidation and all may happen. Uh, and then that's where you can see the um, air bronchus. See here in this case. Uh, uh, I'll show you one more. Same patient, magda pime. You can see this, these lines here. So those are the air-filled bronchi. That is typical um, air bronchogram. In this patient, uh, he, he came with uh, fever and cough. You can see this homogeneous opacity here. The left hemidiaphragm is obscured. The left CP angle is, is also obscured. And then there is pleural effusion. So, so this is a uh, uh, classic case of some pneumonia, left low lobe pneumonia with paranemonic effusion. Okay, uh, even and sometimes and there is a lactasis, um, so you may uh, see the same findings. So you have to correlate with the clinical findings that the patient has got fever and all. So most probably you're dealing with um, pneumonic consolidation and treat accordingly. This this is a different patient CT view. This is how it looks. This is what is called as air bronchogram. The main bronchi are outlined, and whereas the rest of the lung is, you know, it is kind of collapsed, opaque. And then the other commonly encountered um, entities, uh, we would often hear this pneumonia, infiltrate, atelectasis on these radiographic uh, descriptions. So again, as you know, the pneumonia is a eight space disease because of the, the bacterial or viral fungal infections. These spaces of the eight spaces, but I talked about uh, the acinus and all. That is the A space, alveoli, acinus. These are all, when they are filled with fluid, you see an opacity. Um, those are called A space opacities. In case of pneumonia, these are filled with, uh, you know, pus or a thick fluid. Um, and the other, other, um, um, uh, this, this, you cannot differentiate, um, say, so you have, you find an ill-defined opacity or A space opacity in the lung. Uh, it could be because of a pneumonia, or it can, it can be because of neoplastic process, or if even the pulmonary hemorrhage, they may, may look like uh, inflammatory process, process like sarcoidosis, uh, can look like that. And even alveolar proteinosis, they all look same on the radiograph. That you got to be very careful. So hence the description is very important. You have to make your findings um, where the where the opacities are located uh, based on that. And then you have to correlate with the clinical findings, and then you have to make a diagnosis. So, right, and then pneumonia will not cause a volume loss, whereas the atelectasis. I'll come to the difference a little later. Uh, how to differentiate between the pneumonia and atelectasis? They may they may look alike on the um, radiograph. Well, there are features to differentiate between the both. So, X-ray findings you will have this air space opacity, lobar involvement, or uh, sometimes the interstitial opacities. So how do you differentiate this from a mass? So uh, um, usually these masses are very well defined, whereas pneumonia uh, very well defined. And then sometimes to uh, confuse, you have this uh, round pneumonia. There's an entity called round pneumonia where it may look like a mass. So hence you need to follow up those uh, uh, those kind of lesions uh, to make sure they are not neoplasms. And then dep depending on the type of pneumonia, so if there is low bar involvement. Usually the pneumococcal, uh, pneumococcal uh, pathology, and if it is a lobular involvement, often staphylococcal infections, and if it is interstitial, usually these viral pneumonias, they they are, they usually start off as an interstitial process, 
and then they they go on to become these uh, patchy opacities. And usually no air bronchograms are seen this, in these oh, interstitial pneumonias. And then the another common entity, aspiration pneumonia, this is uh, because of the gravitational flow of the aspirated contents or incomplete uh, clearance of these uh, secretions, usually in this IC patients or in you know, a post anesthesia alcoholics, debilitated, demented patients. And this is usually uh, you'll have this anaerobic infection setting in there. And then uh, some of the commonly uh, diffuse pulmonary infections. Uh, so you see this diffuse opacities in uh, both lungs. So we can think of this community acquired pneumonia, so no so common comial if, uh, uh, if it is, if the patient is hospital based or immunocompromised host in case of uh, uh, HIV and all. This is PCP will have a uh, will have a diffuse pattern. Uh, so when you see a diffuse pattern, think of these conditions. Then next, the atelectasis. Atelectasis is nothing but a collapse or incomplete expansion of a lung or a part of lung, usually caused by an endobronchial lesion, some obstruction such as a mucus plug in these uh, asthmatic patients, or a tumor, or sometimes the extensive compression. Whereas uh, in case of uh, you know these lymph nodes sitting in the hilar region, compressing on the bronchi and cause this um, causes atelectasis. And more more commonly, what we see is you see large effusions. So this will uh, compress the adjacent lung. So that is, that we call it as compressive atelectasis. And an unusual type is this. This is a chronic atelectasis, cicatricial atelectasis, and secondary to scarring, TB, or or post radiation. See this uh, uh, chronic atelectasis. And uh, this is how it looks. See this, you know, fairly well defined. No uh, no air bronchogram. And then you can see only part of the right middle lobe is affected here. Sorry, only part of the right heart border is silhouetted. And, and on lateral, if you see that, this is located in the right middle lobe. The opacity is overlying the right middle lobe, right? And uh, to compensate that, there is always this hyperinflation of the other lobes. You can see there is hyperinflation of the other lobes as evidenced by this. Um, this is basically a right middle lobe atelectasis. You're seeing very homogeneous opacity. Okay, when um, unlike in consolidation, where there's in consolidation, you will see this volume loss. And another example of the uh, you can see uh, there's pretty much homogeneous opacity here. And then you can see a hilar mass, irregular hilar mass. So probably a neoplasm sitting in here. And then on the lateral radiograph, if you see this, that is your oblique fissure on the left side. So that has moved forward. That means there is because of the neoplasm sitting in the hilum, is compressing on the bronchi, on the entire bronchus, basically left main bone stem bronchus, or left upper lobe bronchus that is causing collapse of the uh, left upper lobe. So this, you have to look for this movement of these fissures uh, to look for look for the atelectasis. So the, some of the major differences you can see there's volume loss in the atelectasis, whereas uh, no volume loss in the with pneumonias. And then associated ipsilateral shift because of the volume loss, there may be shift of the mediastinum. And whereas with pneumonias, you won't see that. Um, and then these are usually linear or wet shaped with their apex at the hilum, whereas uh, these, whereas the pneumonias may not be so. And then air bronchograms, it's not specific. It can be seen in both pneumonia and uh, um, atelectasis. So another entity, uh, pulmonary edema, which is commonly seen. Not commonly, especially in the cardiac patients, in the cardiac hospitals, you see this could be either cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic. So this is cardiogenic and edema is because of the increased pulmonary capillary pressure, whereas non-cardiogenic due to increased capillary permeability or decreased plasma oncotic pressure. So the causes for the non-cardiogenic edema, you see this in drowsing, uh, near drowning cases, or this inhaled toxins, or uh, allergic alveolitis, you know, uh, Uremic, uremia, and some of the uh, aspiration, you can say altitude sickness, all this will cause, these are all non cardiogenic causes of the pulmonary edema. Um, and uh, that's a typical um, uh, radiograph. You can see this typical description of reverse battering sign appearance. There's involvement of the central part of the lungs, and there is uh, uh, a relative sparing of the peripheral zones. That's very uh, characteristic. Here you can see, in fact, you can see some air bronchograms here because of the uh, 
um, usually this would start as an interstitial process as a linear lines in the uh, perihala regions and it would progress to become uh, like a, um, a space of acidities like this. This may, if you do a CT, this would look like a, some sort of uh, consolidation, you know, subsegmental consolidation. So this is a typical X-ray. And another patient, you can see, uh, again, patient in, uh, you can see the heart enlarged, and then you can see additional shadow here. That's the left atrial enlargement, right? Um, and you can see the prominent markings here. So the patient is in failure, so probably left heart failure. Um, and then uh, and coming to this pediatric chest X-ray, uh, chest radiographic X interpretation. Um, so the slight, I mean, uh, the you have to follow pretty much the same pattern. Now you have to follow. Uh, first look for the trachea, any deviation, narrowing, or displacement. And then the the most important thing is in children, uh, there may be mild deviation of the trachea. And this is extra thoracic part, may they, because of the expression or uh, expression usually, so uh, don't attach much importance to the mild tracheal deviation to the right, that is normal in either adults or children. And then if you see, anytime if you see this intrathoracic trachea being shifted, uh, this especially on the lateral radiograph, even in expression if you see that it is abnormal, always look for any um, mass compressing or displacing it, um, look for the airway, say suppose this group. Uh, laryngeal bronchitis, laryngeal trachea bronchitis. You can see that steeple sign, uh, narrowing of the trachea. Look for the all those. So in children, it is very important. Always start with the um, trachea. Look for any narrowing, deviation, and all sorts of stuff. And then next, move on to this mediastinum. Uh, more often than not, uh, you see this uh, thymic. Uh, we call it. Cardiothymic, instead of calling it cardiomediastinal, you can call it cardiothymic silhouette. This is the typical appearance of, uh, you know, sail sign that is. And then if it is large enough, and these anterior ribs may impinge on it and give this wavy appearance. That is called wavy sign of Mulvey. And um, you look for that. That is a normal, normal appearance. This is very, again, highly variable. You may see it on both sides. You can see on one side. Uh, so you have to uh, pay attention to that. And then heart and mediastinum, uh, always the atrial and visceral situs should be established by inspection of the bronchial anatomy and position of the stomach bubble. Always look for the stomach bubble and look for the cardiac apex, look for the ascending aorta, descending aorta. Um, and then because the right-sided aortic hearts, these are commonly associated with congenital heart diseases. So hence, look for the position of the, see here, the, the expected arch is not there here, but it is on the other side. Uh, if that is the case, and look for the apex. Okay, there are a lot of combinations. If there is total um, uh, situs inverses, um, the probability of congenital heart disease is uh, high. And um, if it is just a right side aortic, aortic arch, only 5% of the patients will have a congenital heart disease, other associated congenital heart disease. So, and then the regarding this pulmonary vascularity, the uh, normally, the lateral third of the lung should not show any lung markings. For any reason, if you're seeing that, that means there is an increased uh, pulmonary flow. That is called pulmonary plethora. You can see that example here. This is a case of see cardiomegaly is there. It's a case of uh, VSD. You can see here the pulmonary mark markings are seen all the way to the periphery. That is called um, uh, pulmonary plethora. And then non-visualization of pulmonary vessels more centrally. So if you're not able to see the pulmonary vessels uh, in this mid zone, so if you divide this into two, three areas, this lateral, middle, and not seeing here, that means seeing this like in this case, not, you can see this overall oligemia. The lungs look, you know, a little translucent. That is because of the, uh, this is a pulmonary hypertension with, uh, pulmonary oligemia, that's called pulmonary uh, peripheral pruning it is called as. So you look for these signs and then uh, other causes of, uh, I mean some of the causes for cardiomegaly or all this congenital heart disease, cardiomyopathies, and then pericardial effusions. In case of pericardial effusions, say very globular, very well defined margins with a narrow pedicle, something like that. So that's, 
and then move on to this uh, often more often than not you have to compare the as i said the compare for the translucency of the lungs in, the, in these patients in these pediatric patients you may not uh, obtain this accurate centering so this will also give rise to sometime this the oblique positioning will uh, give rise to this increased translucency on one side so hence you got to be very careful make sure, make sure um, uh we're getting it right so if you see any time uh, and then the history of when I mean, history suggests you have some sort of history of you know foreign body in uh, aspiration or something inhalation or something like that so always do this decubitus view whenever you do this see this is a left decubitus view when you when you do a uh, left decubitus view because of the pressure this lung will always will always be smaller than the contralateral side uh repeat the same on the other side right side see what is happening this distance remains the same that means there is an obstruction here so this is a um, foreign body aspiration uh, uh case where you know this bronchus is obstructed hence this is hyperinflated so for the reading uh, the textbook by uh, felsen uh, it's like bible for the radiologists that will conclude this session